Welcome everyone to this afternoon's seminar. Uh, I am Lars Rydén, I am director of the Baltic University program. So we are the main organizers, but there are also a number of co-organizers who will introduce themselves uh, after me. Uh, the seminar was from the beginning a conference. And this conference will now, instead of happening right now, happen in Malmö. Uh, the 1st of December. Uh, there will be a big group of cities coming there, several hundred. And we will, together with uh, several organizers, the Union of Baltic Cities, the uh, um, IEE, if you know this, the, uh, the um, Center for um, Industrial Environmental Economy at Lund Universities, and the Climate Kick. This is a big European organization organized the seminar on climate change and city management. But right now, we are happy to uh, welcome Andy Friedman. He is the chairperson of uh, the Swedish Media who in fact uh, more or less formulates right now the strategy for climate uh, management in Sweden, so the national level. And uh, he is also the are you now a co-president or are you vice president of the co -president. Club of Rome? Yeah, co-president okay. of the Club of Rome. And then Björn Sigurdsson here. He will be the second to talk. Uh, he is the climate strategist of Uppsala city. And this is one of the several cities in Sweden and the Baltic Sea region for the moment, then, which has a very strong climate work. So, very welcome. We will have these two presentations, there will be discussions, and then uh, everyone is welcome to stay to have a glass of uh, something to drink and uh, something to uh, chew on and talk to each other after the seminar. Now, um, originally the plan was for um, the cross party committee on environment objectives. Very strange uh, title in English, the idea was that we should have submitted our re study report by end of May. Now uh, we are a bit delayed and we have as a matter of fact had negotiations among the members this very day. <coughs> I took my bike to the center station at 5 to 2 and, and, and they were almost done. So I had to leave as chair. Um, so I cannot tell you about some of the details in the proposal that we are going to launch, I think now on June 27th. But I will indicate in which direction we are going. Mm. And. Um, um, Any talk about climate change should, of course, bring in to the picture a broader problematic. Um, the relationship between mankind and the human society, on the one hand, and the little, this little planet we live on, is uh, not only a question of uh, anything to much of greenhouse gases. It's also a question of overusing or overutilizing a lot of the most important ecosystems. Um, and add to that a lot of pollution of different kinds. Um, and that's why some of the natural scientists uh, now uh, suggest that we should uh, declare the geological epoch we are in, that we are moving from Holocene, where we used to where we have been for the last 10,000 years, it has been a very stable period, not least with regard to climate system. And that we are now moving into Anthropocene, meaning that man is a very powerful agent on this, this small, small planet. Uh, three here stands for we are moving towards three degrees of warming. Six is uh, we are now involved in the sixth major extinction of uh, species, and nine should be a ten. Uh, by the middle of this century, uh, 
the UN me, uh, suggests that the population may be somewhere be, be between 9.7 and 10 billion people, um, which of course is a major challenge. There are people like Hans Rosling who normally say that's no problem because people in uh, low-income countries where most of the new citizens are born, they uh, have their footprint, carbon footprint is very low, so don't care about that. Focus on what's happening in the, in the rich countries. Um, and he's both right and wrong, of course. Right in the sense, yes, that our lifestyles, our consumption patterns, um, make up the, the, the large contributions to, to what we are now uh, uh, experiencing. But at the same time, of course we want that every child who is born on this planet should have a decent standard of life, living. Uh, and that means, of course, eventually that the carbon footprint, demand for different kinds of energy, materials, water, etc., is going to increase. So to, to, to sort of neglect the population issue is, in my opinion, very short-sighted uh, and not, not, not really responsible. Um, in our work, where we have been given the task to develop a strategy leading up till the middle of the century, 2050, <coughs> we, of course, base much of our uh, plans and actions on the IPCC fifth assessment report. And I just tried to summarize some of the main findings. Um, I, I won't go into detail. Uh, low latitudes, we've been asked in places to live. Uh, why, why is that on, 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 on this image? Well, I happened to meet with Jim Hansen uh, when he was in Stockholm about a month before the Paris meeting in November last year. Uh, and he gave a presentation. Um, and he said that uh, apart from his uh, report that was uh, discussed widely in February or March of, about sea level rise, he said, I'm also coming out with a new report where we have <coughs> tried to assess the changes in the average temperature during summertime in la low latitudes. In this part of the world, you could say it's northern Africa, it's southern parts of, of Europe and, and the Middle East. And their findings, and it's not now being published, uh, is that the average temperature during <coughs> summer in these low latitudes have gone up by almost 3 degrees Celsius over 50 year period. And then he added, these places will be very nasty places to live because it will simply be too warm and too dry to grow food. Um, and um, of course, if you have a lot of, of uh, financial resources at your disposal, you can uh, air condition yourself, you can buy your food, you can buy your water, you can buy whatever from somewhere else. And we can see now that there are indeed uh, a lot of rapidly expanding cities in the Middle East, of course. But for the average man, this is going to be a very, very difficult situation. And I think one of the most important aspects of climate change that we have to put into the focus is the risk of large-scale migration. And some people even contend that the crisis in Syria has, as one of its background factors, drought and, and, and movement huge movements to, to, to the cities, etc. I, I won't go into that, but, but I think it's, 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 it's very clear that large-scale migration is, is one of the uh, aspects of climate change that we have to be very, very, take very seriously. Uh, this is another type of um, studies that we have as a starting point. This is from Schellenhuber at the Potsdam Institute. He's done a lot of research on so-called tipping points. And this one shows that uh, around 2 degrees or even below 2 degrees of warming, we have several likely tipping points. One is that coral reefs will more or less disappear. Summer ice in the Arctic is 
also likely to disappear. Um, the alpine glaciers will melt down. Greenland will start uh, accelerate its melting, etc., etc. And as you can see, you have around four degrees the Amazon, the risk of the Amazon rainforest turning from a, a very humid forest system to some kind of savanna. Um, and this again is, is one of the uh, problems that we, of course, try to focus on. Um, and we do it not only because it's important, but also because we have had an ongoing debate with some of the neoclassical economists about climate change and, and about how to, um, how to assess uh, the, the, the future prospects, and, and in particular, how to uh, assess costs in the future. Um, and I had a debate with Jan Hassler, the chairman of the Finanspolitiska Rådet, the, the finance uh, political council, um, the other day. And, you know, they, they have a very strange way of looking at costs and benefits. First of all, they, they mainly look at costs, costs for doing things, measures, incentives, investments of different kinds to try to reduce emissions. They, they rarely look at the benefits. What are the benefits? And they don't look at the costs of inaction. So that's one of the problems. But the other problem is that when you start looking into their models, you realize that they do assume that there is sort of a linear relationship between the damage function in the climate system, on the one hand, and the temperature increase. And we had a huge debate, and I said, but for heaven's sake, what about the tipping points? The, the climate system in, is non-linear in nature. Oh, he said, yeah, well, well, when, when, when you get up into very high temperature increases, well, maybe then, then you have a point. But, you know, to, for today, it's sufficient. So, so this linear damage function is something I, I, I'm just very much concerned about. And, and from that point of view, I think it's very important uh, when we try to describe sort of the, the entry points or, or, the, or the, what's underpinning our analysis and our, our suggestions is to, to, to look at this. Maybe some of these things are not very probable, but I think it's sufficient if there is a probability of one or two or three percent because the consequences are so huge. And one economist who has really got it and, and, and understood this is uh, an American called Weissman, who has written, written about <clears throat> the so-called fat takes, namely that, that you have events that are not very probable, but where the consequences are very, very serious, and that we have to take them very serious as well. <coughs> well, this is just uh, an illustration to, 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 to sort of demonstrate that there is, of course, a, a very intimate relationship between addressing air pollution, not least in Asia, and addressing climate change. There, are, there, is, there is a synergy there. And incidentally, in our proposal that will be submitted in a few weeks' time, we are both suggesting a climate strategy and an air quality strategy for Sweden, because of the city. Here is um, uh, a graph that shows that over the last 10 to 15 years uh, there has been a, a certain progress in the sense that the carbon intensity of the global economy has reduced, been reduced by almost 1% yearly. But here is what is needed to meet the 2 degree target. So we would have to six double or whatever uh, the, the efforts in the coming decades. Well, in December last year we had the Paris conference and um, depending on where you stand, it was a, a, a big success or it was not a big success, something else. 
Um, but I think that, that most people, regardless of their more detailed comments, they agree that it was a step forward because 195 or 196 countries came together and at least on paper agreed on ambitious goals. Not only to they continue to sort of say, yes, we have to avoid two degrees. Um, and then they said, we have to make every effort to, to come down lower in terms of temperature increase, uh, approaching 1.5 degrees. Uh, and that, that, of course, was positive. But when you start looking into the details and how to interpret the Paris Agreement, I very often quote this, this guy, who some of you probably read in The Guardian, uh, Georges Montbiot. He said the day after he had an article saying, by comparison, what it could have been, it's a miracle. By comparison, what it should have been, it's a disaster. And what does he mean by that? Well, on the one hand, very good that we have these ambitious goals, but where, where, is, where, where is the meat? Uh, where, where, where is it really spelled out? How make this happen? And there is very little said about how to reach the objectives. And there is no agreement on a carbon tax. And there is not even an agreement on how to phase out fossil fuel subsidies. So, of course, this is, this is a problem. So that's why we have to try to in, instill action wherever we can in different parts of the world. And we could add that a Republican victory in November could be a disaster. And here is the now remaining contender. <clears throat> I had another picture a couple of months ago when there were still three candidates. But now it's only this guy. And, and this is what, uh, what, what he said a couple of, of weeks ago. Wind farms are a disaster for the environment. They kill the birds. They are very expensive in terms of energy. And they are made in China. Um, and he has since come out with a major energy speech about 10 days ago. And when you read it, it's a horror story. Basically, he says, we are going to have a revival of uh, coal, coal production. Coal is good for America. Uh, and we are going to increase employment. We are going to increase uh, the burning of coal, etc., etc. And he is going to make every effort to close down or to undermine the Paris Agreement, etc., etc. And I, a couple of months ago, nobody took this seriously. But now, you don't know what happens. Uh, and my wife used to live for 10 years in America. And she's always said, it's impossible to predict an American presidential election. And she gave us an example when she lived in, uh, in the U.S. in 1976, where Jimmy Carter came from nowhere and became the president. Um, and this is just one, one example. Um, and the fact is that both Trump and Hillary Clinton are very little liked by, by the electorate. So you have a lot of um, yeah, question marks what's, what's really going to happen. So uh, we may, up, may end up with Trump. Um, and we may end up with other leaders in other parts of the world which, which are not going to make it easier. Another way of looking at uh, Paris is, of course, to see how, how much emissions of greenhouse gases can we still emit while still staying within 2 degrees or 1.5 degrees. Well, it depends on what probability you, you are looking at. Normally, scientists say, okay, well, we can emit another 1,000 gigatons of carbon dioxide equivalents. Um, but then you should be reminded of the fact that it's only the probability that then is only 66%, two-thirds. If you want somewhat higher, they say, say three-fourths or 75%, it goes down to seven or eight hundred gigatons, and 1.5 degrees. I mean, it's six, seven, eight years of present level of emissions, and then it stopped. So, so this shows that that to do this is is going to be very, very difficult. 
And I should add that for most of the so-called two-degree pathways that the IPCC have developed to sort of demonstrate how could the world go from where we are to, to below two degrees in the next 50 to 100 years. They include a lot of so-called negative emissions. And negative emissions is really to, to take out not fossil carbon, but <coughs> biomass-based carbon out of the atmosphere. And most often people talk about it, refer about it in, in the sense of bio-CCS, um, which means that you, uh, you, you burn a lot of biomass, um, and then you capture the carbon, and then you put it somewhere in the ground. And we are talking about huge volumes. We are talking about doing that for decades, on and on and on again, on an area larger than India. So, uh, however you look at it, uh, this is going to be very, very tough. And one of the conclusions I've drawn is that the sooner you can reduce emissions, the less dependent you are on negative emissions. And that, that is probably very positive for, for the planet and for our society. So given, given these rather maybe gloomy pictures, still there is a spirit right now that seems to be optimistic. The use of coal is shrinking, not everywhere, but in some places. Investments in renewables, in particular in the power sector, are increasing. But in the transportation sector, still gasoline and diesel is totally dominating. Uh, we have a lot of big companies who are very positively engaged. We have hundreds and hundreds of city ma mayors in Paris. Uh, that was, according to people who participated, probably the best meeting of them all. A very positive spirit. And uh, 70 to 80 percent of all the emissions in, in the world originate in, in urban areas. So it makes sense for, for mayors to be, to be very concerned. So, so these are some positives. Then, of course, the price of oil has plummeted. It's now gone back from 28, 29, where it was in January, up to almost $50 per barrel. Um, nobody knows what it will be a year from now or half a year from now. It's one of the most difficult commodities uh, to estimate future prices. And nobody has been able to explain to me how it could go from $147 per barrel to 40 in about three or four months uh, a couple of years ago. Um, supply and demand, yes, but there are also other factors at play. Um, political factors, Saudi Arabia versus Iran, Saudi Arabia versus uh, Russia, Saudi Arabia versus shale production in, in the U.S., etc. It's very complicated. But what is interesting, and if Thomas Kohlberger, who is a world-leading expert on energy system, and if he was here, he would say, I wouldn't look upon the low price as a problem. I would see it as the opposite. Because eventually oil and gas companies, like coal companies now, will run into serious problems because they will not be able to continue to invest in oil and gas exploration and at the same time pay the dividends that their shareholders are used to. And this means that the whole sector will probably start to retract. Um, this being said, on the other hand, if you look at the statistics over the number of cars being sold over the last two years, for instance in Sweden, gas clusters are on the rebound again. So, no doubt, uh, it means a lot for ordinary people. If a, a, a litre of gasoline costs 12 kroner or 16 kroner, it means a lot. So, so this, is, this, is, um, this is really a, a, a question mark. And then, of course, you have a lot of tensions and conflicts in the world. And I've been working in the European Union for 10 years, and my, my experience is that 
the EU is not very good at handling more than one or possibly two crises at the same time. And the fact that they have been, that the EU has been involved in other types of crises now for so long means that this issue is a little bit on the back burner. And I met with uh, Franz Timmermans, the uh, deputy uh, commission uh, president the other day, he was in Stockholm, and, and he confessed, he said, I mean, we have enormous problems now to continue pursuing what we think are the right policies in several areas because of the migration crisis, because of the tensions with Putin, because of the continuing problems with Greece, etc. Et so, so you see, so the picture is mixed. Here is, of course, very positive, the learning curves for wind and, and uh, solar. And it's, it's striking to see that in large regions today, both wind and solar are cost competitive with building new coal power plants. Of course, you need to add storage capacity. Um, you need to add smart grids, etc. But no doubt, we have reached sort of a tipping point that is very, very important. Here, here is just what, what the potential to of savings from, from a lot of household appliances. That was about me in Swedish. Here is a, a picture which I think is very important. It deals with storage and the cost for, for batteries. They've gone down very, very significantly over the last five years. And we have on the commission, uh, on, yeah, on, on our council, we have Bo Nolmark, who is one of the leading experts in the world on electrification. And his prediction is that the costs for battery per kilowatt hour that used to be 1,100 euros per kilowatt hour only five years ago is around somewhere in between 300 and 400 today. It's going to be below 100 before 2025. So, so that also will change the picture dramatically because, as you know, buying an electric car, the, the, the biggest cost is really the storage issue. And, and that, is, that is not changing, which also means that you will very likely have um, a secondary market for batteries that can be used in, in, in households and, and back up for, for, the, for the electric grid. So a whole new situation is developing from very centralized power structures to decentralized, which also is important. Uh, I think this was fantastic. Uh, three days after Mr. Um, uh, Elon Musk announced his uh, uh, Tesla 3, um, the Model 3, uh, three days afterwards, 276,000 people had listed that they wanted to buy the car, but they had also paid $1,000 each to be on the waiting list. Quite an intelligent way of, of financing your company. But that, this just shows what, what momentum there is, although we still only have about one million electric cars in the world on the roads. Uh, here is um, from Bloomberg Energy um, an estimate how much oil that will be removed from the market, from demand in the beginning of the 2030s because of electrification of passenger cars. Around 13 million barrels a day, and that's a lot, that's a lot. So that just shows that also those who really predict from a financial point of view what's gonna happen, they believe this is going to happen. Here is another very positive thing. Uh, in the world, the estimate is that we need roughly $90 trillion of infrastructure investments till 2030. If it's done the traditional way without taking into account the climate risks, the cost is 89 trillion. If we take into account the climate risks and invest in climate smart technology, whether we talk about transportation, buildings, etc., the added cost is only about three, four percent. And I think this is this is very telling 
And this is, this is done based on conventional economics. Because the benefits here are so many. Cleaner air, uh, less climate risk, um, and of course also lower running costs. Because when you invest in alternative energy, in particular solar and wind, etc., you invest in the technology, in the equipment, and then the running cost is almost zero, which is the opposite from, from, from conventional energy. Now, the Swedish task force that I'm chairing, we have already put the proposal on the table a few months ago. We suggest that we enact a climate law, and we have been very much inspired by, by the Brits. Um, <coughs> and we, in fact, we went to London for a seminar with the Climate Change Committee in the UK, and many of my members were very skeptical when we embarked on the plane. When we went back, the spirit was different. And the main reason was that John Gammer, who is now Lord Devon, uh, who, by the way, was environment minister during Thatcher's time, even, and who is the, the, the chairman of the Climate Change Committee, he said, if we hadn't had this climate act that tells the government in what direction to move, and for each five-year period, reduce emissions according to a special target. Um, I'm absolutely convinced, he said, that the coalition government between Cameron and Clegg, that they would have postponed a lot of climate action, um, arguing that the economy was weak, etc. But now they had this act, and they knew they had to change the climate act, and um, and they knew they couldn't they couldn't change it. They could never have it, uh, get it through, through Parliament, because nobody, very few MEPs, mem MPs would, would like to, to sign such, such a proposal. So we, we suggest the, the, the same kind of system in Sweden. Then we have agreed seven political parties in a Parliament that agrees on very little. We have agreed to move the target from 2050 to 2045. And we've said that Sweden should be net zero in territorial emissions by 2045. And out of that, 85% at least must be in Sweden. The rest can then be done somewhere else, either by planting more forests or by uh, buying emission credits or investing in developing countries. Um, and one of the reasons for that is, of course, that <coughs> in the agricultural sector, we can never eliminate all the emissions from methane and nitrogen oxides, etc. We have also suggested that we have a sort of four-year period, so each new incoming government should present a climate action plan for the next four years, based on an analysis, thorough analysis, what, what, what has happened before. <clears throat> so we give, we give sort of the whole system uh, a, a very rigorous uh, sort of framework. And then we establish the kind of climate change committee that they have in the British system that has as its main task to play an oversight role, but also to look at, um, to really follow closely that all major policy areas and sectors move in the same direction. And that's lacking today. And by the way, Conjunture Institute, who is another one of my friends, uh, they wrote in their response to our uh, proposal that they couldn't really understand why this was needed. They said, that's the role that we could serve. Well, I wouldn't like that to happen, I can tell you. Um, this is the, the, the kind of slope of, of, of the emissions uh, that we suggest, um, and this, this is partly Swedish, partly English. This is industry, the black here. This is a little bit still um, district heating. This brown is transport. And as you can see, we assume that transport will be zero in terms of carbon emissions, well ahead of 2045. Then we have some agriculture left and, and a little bit else. So, so this is how we envisage this, uh, this to happen. 
Now we are going to submit the final proposal end of June. We had a lot of detailed measures and incentives. We are going to agree on targets for 2030 and beyond. Um, and we are going to have specific focus on industries like steel and cement, where we have large emissions today and we don't see technologies around the corner that will eliminate them. Uh, transport and mobility, of course, agriculture, the energy sector, the forest sector. And then, of course, we, we will have, I hope, an intelligent discussion where we compare territorial emissions, what's happening physically in Sweden, consumption, <coughs> we import a lot of embedded carbon, and then we also export quite a lot of things that we produce in a climate smart way. And as long as those things are needed in the world economy, it wouldn't help the climate if we close down factories in Sweden, rather the opposite. But we have to sort of try to balance all these perspectives. And this one, the territorial emissions, there we, there we have control. On the two others, we don't have the same control. And then we are also focusing a lot on horizontal issues like material efficiency. And you may not believe it, but material efficiency has not been a priority in climate policy making so far. So the whole, the whole discussion now on circular economy has been nowhere from the point of climate. Um, and yet, we have focused so much on energy, but energy and materials are two sides of the same coin. And if we use materials more efficiently, if products, consumer products last longer, if they are designed so that you can reuse, and recycle in a better way, uh, if you can remanufacture things, etc., you save a lot of energy. Um, and you have less mining, but you have a lot of other activities. And such an economy is, I think, very interesting. And I, as a matter of fact, I brought a few copies of a study we did in the Club of Rome, focusing on five European countries, looking at, on the one hand, the carbon effect of moving towards a certain economy, but also the employment effect. I, I have always been arguing in favor of more long-termism in both the political system and the economic system. But here, when I'm given the task to look 35 years ahead, I realize how difficult it is, because there is so much change happening. In particular, all these disruptive technologies digitization, nanotechnology, biotechnology, neurosciences, etc. And to anticipate what those technologies mean for society in the future and for policy making in this area is not easy. And there is in fact a rather great risk that we propose things that look very stupid 10 years from now. So how do you remain the flexibility? Then, of course, another issue is what about the rest of the world? And when I talk to people from the finance ministry, they say all the time, well, if the rest of the world moves in the same direction, okay, but if they don't. Because then what we are suggesting is going to be much, much more difficult. Both because we, got, we are not going to benefit from the same uh, innovations from other parts of the world. I mean, look at the, look at the Germans and solar energy, or the Danes and wind, wind energy. They took they took the upfront costs, and now they share that technology at much lower cost with the rest of the world. If that won't happen in the future to the same extent, our, our transformation is going to be more expensive. Price of oil is also a big question mark. And then we have some rules at the EU level when it comes to energy taxation and state aid, and I won't go into details, that are rather troublesome. And one of the reasons we have not seen the development of the second generation of biofuels that many of us have been asking for, using residue materials from the forest industry, lignin, etc. Why, why we don't have them? It's simply because it's too risky for big companies to invest in such biorefineries. They cost maybe 5 to 10 billion, uh, no, 500 to 1 billion uh, euros to invest in, at least for the first couple of biorefineries. Uh, and we, and, and, and the, the experts know exactly what to do and how to do it. But
but they say as long as we don't know about any taxation and the rules of the game 10, 15 years from now, you cannot expect us to do it. In particular not when the price of oil is what it is. Then, well, I've already said that, a division of responsibility, that's also a very tricky issue. And Bjorn, you are going to talk about the community perspective. Who is doing what? And, and, and what about rule, rule making at different levels? Uh, for instance, uh, a municipality in Sweden cannot impose a tax, for instance, on uh, local traffic. They cannot impose a tax on uh, using uh, at the deck, um, um, uh, tires with the tires. Huh? Yeah. Okay. Uh, then there are lots of things where where municipalities are prevented from doing the right thing. Um, so we have, I hope, a rather intelligent discussion in, in the report where we look at who is doing what. And in particular with the aim of handing over more responsibility and, and right to decision to, to the local and regional level. Another very troublesome thing has been the finance, finance sector, who has not given much consideration to these issues in the past. Change is now happening, and it's happening quite fast, but I think we need regulation. We need to uh, demand from all financial institutions, and in particular those who uh, manage funds for the longer term, to, to, to report on the climate risks in their portfolio. And we also need uh, to take a look at how to mobilize more funding for long-term sustainability investments, where the rate of return is not going to be 15, 20% that most of the people in that sector seems to be used to. It's going to be lower rates of return, but it's going to be a steady rate of return. And there are certain uh, provisions within the financial sector. For instance, oh, the AP funds, they can only put 5% of their assets in non-listed companies. And most of the interesting new companies offering sustainability solutions, they are not listed. So, so there, are, there are a lot of, 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 of issues that ha has to be dealt with because this, the finance sector must back up the right kind of investments. And then I've already talked about what, what is cost efficient. We didn't have time, we have had not much more than a year, we didn't have time to um, solicit um, specific research studies. What we did was we put in place six round tables and we did it together with um, MISTRA, which is a, a, a very interesting uh, research supporting foundation. Uh, and as you can see, we looked at basic materials, bioeconomy, mobility, food, digitization, and resource efficiency. And then we had one special round table <laughs> where we tried to deal more generically with the issue now, what is the rule of the states and politics, and what is the rule of markets? And that tension has been going like this over the, the years. We are now seeing more and more, in, not only in Europe, but in different parts of the world, more of collaboration, and we believe that that is, that is very, very right. We need uh, transformative solutions, uh, not incremental change. Um, and this will require, again, then serious decoupling when it comes to the use of energy and materials in relation to economic activity. Here you can see from the International Resource Panel that I'm a member of, this is a report they um, issued to the G7 meeting in Tokyo a few weeks ago. And as you can see, this is the demand for materials in the world. And the black dotted line there is GDP growth. And as you can see right now, what's happening in the world economy <coughs> is not decoupling. It's, it's in reality recoupling. 
So demand for materials is growing faster than the global economy, world economy. And if you look more carefully into it, of course, in OECD countries, demand is going down slightly. So we are decoupling, or at least moving in that direction. But as you can see, the BRICS countries, their demand is going up. And this is the world, which is slightly moving upwards. Why do I show you this? Well, to, to demonstrate that uh, demand for energy and materials has been increasing rapidly and is continuing to increase rapidly. And it has a direct effect, of course, with today's energy systems on, on carbon emissions. So we have to do something about that, absolutely. Um, and here is something that you have to ponder about. 50% of the urban infrastructure that we will need in 2050 has not been built yet. And you can imagine, if that is done the conventional way, we are, we are toasted. But if it's done in a more clever way, um, then, then we may make it. So again, um, decoupling. Material efficiency is very much needed. We did this study in the Club of Rome and we looked at five countries, Finland, France, Sweden, Spain and the Netherlands. Don't ask me why those countries, it just so happened. We are now moving into Eastern Europe because there they are lagging behind in this kind of discussion. We are going to analyze both Poland and the Czech Republic. Um, and we, we, we asked ourselves, what would the economy look like macroeconomically if we move <coughs> In the, if, in the direction of more renewables, more energy efficiency, more material efficiency. And the interesting thing is that in all the five countries, and here is only Sweden, you see if we, if we did all these scenarios at the same time, carbon emissions would go down by roughly two-thirds. And we would have at least 100,000 new net jobs. And we would have a slight positive effect on our trade balance. Not not so strange because we would import less fossil fuels. The interesting thing I think is particularly this one because industry and trade unions have looked upon the greening of the economy as more or less of a threat, as something negative from their point of view. They've seen it as a burden, as a problem. Here you have a study and there are more studies like this from Ellen MacArthur Foundation, from McKinsey that shows that there is a positive employment effect. And it's not, it's, 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 very, it's very logical because uh, a, an economy which maintains and uh, cares for what we already have produced is more of a service economy. And uh, that will require more manpower than more or less automated manufacturing. So I'm, I'm not surprised. Now, then, finally, priority areas for the climate action strategy in Sweden. Well, we, we, we of course, we make a pitch for green growth and, and also to benefit as much as possible from disruptive technologies. And we believe there, is, there, is, there are lots of interesting areas of interface between the new information economy and lower carbon emissions. But you need policy frameworks. For instance, uh, uh, driverless cars, which uh, a development that is coming very, very rapidly. Unless you have a framework within the cities that really make this positive for everyone, it can also be the opposite. Uh, we believe we need to be very proactive from the government's point of view uh, in supporting R&D and innovation. Transport and mobility. We are suggesting that support should be forthcoming for electrification, for smart biofuels, and then of course uh, we don't know whether hydrogen will be an alternative. It may be. So we shouldn't pick the winners. It's interesting to note that in Japan, they are not going for electrification, they are going for hydrogen. Well, they call it electrification, but, but anyway, it's, it's, another, it's another way of, of addressing the problem. 
Um, but we are very, very confident that if the government puts in place the right incentives for electrification, for smart biofuels, and for maybe hydrogen, in 2030-2035 we could, in reality, be more or less independent from fossil fuels. We cannot think away all the cars that have already been bought or sold. And that's why we are suggesting so-called drop-in uh, fuels, that, that you can mix gasoline and diesel progressively with, with smart biofuels. But they must be spot. It's not a question of, of turning wheat or, or corn into ethanol. It's a question of really producing uh, uh, biofuels that, are, that really give you a, a climate benefit. Of course, city planning is going to be very, very important. Uh, we are going to build maybe one million new apartments during the next 10 to 15 years. How that is being done is going to be very, very important. And we suggest life cycle analysis should be the base both for um, construction in roads, etc., but also in, in, in new buildings. Um, because so far, at least in this country, and I think in most countries, the only focus has been on how much energy is being used to heat and cool the building once it's built. But we know now from a lot of studies that more than 50% of the greenhouse gases are, are uh, generated during the construction of the buildings. Um, steel and cement industry, uh, we suggest that the government takes enters into a partnership with these industries to develop um, both CCS as a fallback strategy, but hopefully next generation of uh, production technology, which is carbon free. And in particular for the steel industry to use hydrogen looks very promising, looks very promising. But it will not happen by itself because the, the steel industry is losing money today and they, they cannot afford this transformation. Food production, um, and I should not talk more now, I should give you the floor. Um, food production is of course very, very tricky. There are certain emissions that I referred to in the beginning, uh, like methane and nitrous oxides that you cannot think away. And we are probably going to produce more food in the future, not less food. Our population will be maybe 12 or 13 million people in 2050. And uh, we also believe quite strongly that southern Europe is going to produce less food in the future because of the change in climate. So we have to be ready to produce more food. And then we must somehow deal with the emissions. And you can do a lot conventionally to bring down the present emissions. You can eliminate fossil fuels within the agriculture sector. You, you can, they, can, they can drive their tractors on biogas, whatever. But what we are also looking into is to um, develop the uh, farming technologies and methodologies. Um, perennial crops instead of annual crops. Uh, tilling less, low tilling. Building carbon in the soil. Um, we have seen some fascinating experiments being done, both in the US, but also in southern Sweden, in Scotland, and it works. So, the dream from some people is that one could eventually turn agriculture from being a carbon source into a carbon sink, at least less of a source than what we have today. Forest products for substitution, we believe these new biorefineries should be built uh, and they will deliver a lot of products. Green chemistry, textiles, fish fodder, uh, carbon fiber, uh, wood for construction, etc. Um, and it's fascinating when you start looking into it. Um, so what you really do, you prolong the carbon sink from the forest phase into society. And, and if you do that in a clever way while maintaining uh, a net sink in the forest system, I think that, that is something that Sweden, Finland and a few other forested countries could benefit from. 
Circular economy, I talked about waste indigenation is linked to that. Finance sector, I also talked about public procurement should be more pro proactive. You know, it's almost 20% of the economy what is being purchased by the government agencies, by communities, by the regions. And they could, of course, put demands that are much more climate friendly uh, than they have in the, in the, in the past. Finally, behavioural change. I haven't touched upon it. It's, it's an important issue. We haven't had time really to, to dig into it, but, but we are very conscious of the fact that here is going to... We're going we're gonna to need a better cooperation with behavioural scientists than what we've had in the past. Finally, we have not been asked to dig into the nitty-gritty details about the whole energy system. We just take for granted that the Energy Commission, who is working parallel to us, is going to uh, address uh, the power production <coughs> issues. So, um, to wind up, we, we believe that Sweden is uniquely placed to really take the lead. It's one of the few countries that could make a transition to a um, zero carbon economy or net zero carbon economy. We have our hydropower, we have good conditions for wind, we have our forests. Um, and, and I've already commented upon some of the bullet points mentioned here. Last but not least, I think we have a development cooperation policy that gives prior to climate change. And I think eventually that the relations between industrialized countries and developing countries is going to matter more and more. Uh, and we should have done much more in the past to help promote um, low carbon investments, uh, etc., etc. Uh, it's now starting to happen, uh, albeit with too little money and too little funding, but it's starting to happen. And I think the fact that the government in its reshuffle the other day made Isabella Levine not only Minister of Development Cooperation, but also for international climate policy, I think that, that was a clever, clever um, move. And it demonstrates the, that, that this government is serious about reaching out in a better way and that the international dimension of this is very important. Thank you. Janus, um, a few questions, but Björn is uh, on the stage soon. But do you have some questions to Anders? There will be more opportunities to discuss. Certifications <coughs> um, and so on. Yes, please. Uh, I work for Vatten Falmberg of Sala, and we also use the technology waste incineration. As you told, it's a part of the circular economy. When material happens <coughs> alone, and have a life in many cycles, it needs to be uh, taken out of society. Some material needs to be uh, incinerated, and we transform this to district heating, etc. So I think that one thing to, to address this would be saying uh, also the root cause of why waste incineration emit uh, fossil carbon today is the plastic part. To address the, the real cause <coughs> instead of just the end. Uh, so we need to go from from solutions in the end to go upstream and address the, the root cause. Uh, so to add bioplastic as one of the issues would be clarifying, I think. We haven't had time to, to, to dwell into the plastics issue we should have. Uh, but I agree with you. It's a very important issue. I think Sweden is uh, criticized for incineration too much and mm. too little recycling, especially mm. plastic. Mm. Absolutely. Thank you. Um, I wonder about the challenges here and what you yourself regard to be the afternoon's challenges for Sweden. I could imagine that you wrote the finance sector must be forceful. And the question is, isn't it so that the finance sector must be forced to do it? And if so, how? And another challenge, of course, is the political support. Uh, I mean, when it really comes to uh, transformation, do you feel 
Well, I mean, if I had, if, if this had been an inquiry that was mostly expert-based, I think we would have come up with very sharp suggestions uh, related to the finance sector and really forcing them. Now we are a cross-party committee and the aim has been really to, to put in place a platform for agreement so that we knew that this will stick in the years to come. So, and then by definition, it has not been really possible to dwell into the details of what country. But I, I, I think you're right. And I think that the big mistake that was made in the 1980s was the deregulation of the finance sector without really thinking through the consequences. And now it's very difficult to do much about it because it's international, because capital is moving freely, etc. So, um, and that's why, you know, the EU or the international context is very important. But, but I agree with you. I, I, I have my doubts. But at the same time, some people tell me that more and more people in the finance sector are starting to realize that climate change is for real, and that maybe it's quite risky that somewhere between, between 12 and 50 percent of a traditional or a conventional portfolio is invested in, in carbon. So the, the things are happening, and I don't think we can really anticipate these tipping points. All of a sudden, who, who thought five years ago that Vattenfall and Eon would be companies losing a lot of money? They were. They were earning a lot of revenue and profits. So, so things do, do change. Secondly, will the public accept? I think it's very much a question of A, um, promoting a dialogue about this, uh, and B, um, managing the economy in a way that, that people don't feel threatened. Because I think when people are threatened, they tend to look for easy solutions. And then you have Trump, Trump and others who, who present these solutions, gladly. And I, I read an article in the New York Times yesterday saying that the best prospect for Trump is not a major crisis, rather a small crisis. Um, a lot of problems all the time. Uh, uh, instilling uncertainty among people. So I think leadership is going to be very important, very, very important. And in Sweden, I would think that a broader-based government would be the best thing we could have. This idea that either the green, uh, red-green coalition or the alliance would, would, would have their own majority, I think it's uh, very unrealistic. So. Um, the sooner the better if, if we could have a broader-based government.